My first question today came from Martin, and he asked me my thoughts on bands that fade out their songs. Honestly, in 99% of cases, this drives me absolutely nuts. Seriously, I can't stand it. I want to know what exactly the band or the singer didn't want me to hear, and why they couldn't be bothered to come up with a real ending to the song. I get that in some cases, that other 1% that the fade works perfectly with the mood that the band is trying to set on the song. Or maybe it's flowing into the next track, but aside from that, fading out a song to me is a musical cop-out. Thankfully, a large number of older songs that have that fade out have become available over the last decade. And honestly, I've thoroughly enjoyed hearing complete versions of some of my favorite songs. But to tell you the truth, the fade out in music is just one of those things I will never get behind. My second question came from Jeff on Facebook, and he asked me what my general thoughts were on bands that make exclusive tracks for exclusive retailers. To tell you the truth, this has been going on a lot longer than most people think, as you can see very similar things all the way back in the 50s and 60s. You'll find differences in track lineups, as well as completely different recordings of the same song when you look at different releases from different countries. From Hendrix to The Clash to a ton of other artists, this just wasn't all that uncommon, but back then, not many people knew about it. Then in the mid-90s, this kind of became the thing to do, with Japanese releases getting a ton of exclusive tracks. And it's also where you see the rise of big box stores offering specific versions of the album that have tracks exclusive to their store. The latter obviously comes down to that store giving the band a huge sum of money. And to tell you the truth, this always bothered me that I was being inadvertently penalized for going to a different store but buying the same album. On the band side of things, I have a feeling this one was a no brainer because that money could not have been a small amount. And at the same time, it was tons of free press from that store. But to me, it sucks any way you slice it. But with the scarcity of CD selling stores now, it's pretty much gone away. But it's now become the iTunes exclusive track or the full album download only exclusive track. The latter of these two, I don't really mind that much, but let's be honest, in the age of YouTube, there's really no longer such a thing as an exclusive track. Finally, Karen emailed me saying that since we're halfway through 2013, what my favorite albums of the year are so far. Honestly, 2013 has been about average to me in terms of great albums that have come out. Though I will say that this half of the year is much better than the same period last year. So in no order whatsoever, here are my favorite five albums of 2013 so far. Justin Timberlake's 2020 experience was a really fun record and I still play it regularly. How to Destroy Angels, Welcome to Oblivion kicked so much ass and I cranked it just this morning. The new Queens of the Stone Age record, like Clockwork, is definitely one that's going to hold up over time. And my favorite two records so far this year are definitely Kiki Pow's Pines record and the brand new Sister Trionics record from Deep Valley, which is going to be very tough to top as my favorite album of the year. You need all five of those, so make sure you have them. So those are my questions for this week. If you've got a music-related question, hit me with it at thedailyguru at gmail.com. You can follow me on Twitter and Facebook right here, and I'll see you guys again tomorrow. <laughs>